All right. Thanks for uh, having me tonight. Thanks for jumping on and joining us. Uh, like Mary said, let, uh, we'll keep this pretty casual. Um, ask away when you've got a questions. Uh, don't be afraid to stop me. Um, so I'm going to stay away from really heifer selection. And there's been plenty of talks on heifer selection, um, whether or not it's selecting heifers that um, uh, are, are born earlier or, or conceive earlier, and, and there's benefits to those, but we're going to stick, stay away from heifer selection and, and just uh, talk a little bit about nutritional management, because this is a time frame. I know Mary and, and Casey and, and a bunch of us get questions about developing rations for heifers, uh, and, and so it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, type of deal, but um, we'll just uh, touch on a few few things uh, that, that may help you and, and like I said feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, just a quick overview. Um, so for the nutritional aspect, we we'll really talk about from the, the feeding side, nutritional side of heifer development and really the cost. And so I'll touch on uh, a little bit on, on percent body weight stuff, but um, really from heifer development is think about your cost of developing heifers. Uh, and that cost is very important from the aspect of having that heifer pay herself off. Uh, and so if I'm pouring a lot of feed into heifers, there, there's a bigger chance that heifer will never pay herself off. And so if that's the case, um, someone has to pay that off the heifer for her. And so, um, so, so that's important. To, to realize is, is the long-term influence that, that developing heifers has on your profitability. And I'll show you some more data, but, but you know, think about break-even, so that time period when heifers start paying themselves off from either purchasing heifers or developing and, and getting that actual first calf for the heifer, it, it, it could be from anywhere from three to 11 years. And so if a heifer takes 11 years to pay herself off and she's not staying in the herd but two or three years, someone's going to have to pay for that. And if in your herd from a total aspect of its 11 years, you're really not in a profitable position at all. And so think about that nutritional management of the, those heifers in, in terms of being very economical from a longevity and profitability time frame. We're going to touch on timing of gain, and I think that's very important But when we think about controlling your costs, because I can control some timing of gain and be very reproductively efficient and still be really low cost and really sustainable. But another aspect that I really want producers to think about is replacement heifers as a stocker operation. You know, if it's a, a, a yearling or, or, or a steer or a heifer, it's still a, year, a stocker operation. It's just with heifers, you have another option. Not only you have replacements for your herd that you need to select from, but you got some flexibility within that system of how you market and, and, uh, uh, and uh, manage those heifers. So I really would like producers to think about the heifer as a stocker operation rather than just a replacement heifer or a reproductive event. Uh, George, did you have a question? Okay. So, you know, from, from the 1960s to 1980s, there's always this talk about target body weight, and getting heifers to a target body weight. And so from all that research, there's these guidelines that we need heifers to 60 to 65% of the mature body weight by the time of breeding. And that's really an extremely safe number. There's some problems with it. I'll, I'll talk briefly about that, but it's an extremely safe number. Um, it, but in a lot of our areas, especially in Western Nebraska, in semi-arid environments, it, from an economic standpoint, it, it's very tough to do. Um, and so from the, lot, well, from the about early 1990s, late 1980s, there's been a lot of research that looked at uh, uh, developing heifers at a lighter body weight. And a lot of the research actually didn't have a target body weight. I know when I started my grad program at New Mexico State, 
that August when we weighed heifers off of a project, they were about a month out of breeding, weighing five and a half, six hundred pounds. You know, coming from Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, where a lot of heifers went on wheat pasture over winter, came in in a really heavy body weight, and moving out to New Mexico, that was a really big eye opener, is developing heifers at this really light body weight, and and looking at the, the you know the reproductive events, I'll show you that data later, but there's a big long term impact that that can have as well. So briefly today, I, I, I took about 200 head of cows that we had mature body weights on and looked at what's their actual percent of mature body weight versus predicted as a heifer. Because we throw around this percent body weight as this, this, this goal of getting animals to whatever it is, 60, 65 percent, but we're using a herd average. And so there's problems with that herd average is from the light end, we underestimate what their mature body weight is. From the heavy end, we're underestimating what their um, mature body weight is. And, and so there's some really big issues on, on the two sides of the average. And, and so, and a lot of times th th those efforts and every one of these made it to six years of age, you can see where on their actual percent body weight, a lot of them were on that really light end. And, and so it's really important when you think about trying to achieve a whatever it is, 60%, you're taking a herd average. And a lot of those heifers, because of your demographics of your herd, may be mature cows at 700 pounds to 1,700 pounds. You may have an average 1,100 pounds. You're going to have a big range in what's that mature body weight. And, and so it's important to think about when you're doing this from a percent mature body weight, it's just an average across those, and you're gonna over and underestimate a lot of those cows within that. And for instance, in our data set, if I was trying to achieve a 65% from our predicted, they, they would actually be somewhere around 60% from this data. And so I would overestimate what their predicted body weight, and I, I would actually hit about 60%. If they're around 50%, what was my predicted, they're actually like 55%. And so th there is a big range in what that true percent body weight is versus predicting it from an average. So one th thing we really need to focus on from heifer development, and I talked about this a little bit, but the long-term implications of those protocols, whatever it is, whatever you want to utilize in your heifer development strategy, we've really got to look at this from a long-term aspect because there's a huge cost in developing heifers and, and, and making sure we're developing properly to fit our management, to fit our environment, that they pay themselves off and be very productive within that system. And, and the, the reason behind this is Longevity or reproduction is a lowly heritable trait. And, and so how we develop them or how we select them can have a greater impact on longevity versus uh, the heritability of, of heifer development. And this is our only time we actually can select for fertility in the herd. When a cow comes up open, you're not selecting for fertility at that point. You're just calling a cow. Here is my only time I can put pressure on an animal that I can select for a, a fertility trait. Now, if I'm overdeveloping heifers and allowing some subfertile heifers to enter the herd, well, they, they, there's a, a larger chance they're going to drop out of the herd at an earlier age quicker than something that was a little more fertile. And so if you want something to drop out of the herd, you're going to want them to drop out as a heifer versus a two or three-year-old. So that's very important to think about is this long-term impact. This is some data out of Miles City, Montana. Uh, there's, there are several thousand animals in there, but it just gives you an idea of retention rate of the herd. And, and like I talked about, you have a big dropout as a two and three-year-old. So how can I select or, or develop those heifers that don't have this big dropout that by end of that third year, that I'm down to 50 or 60% of efforts that I developed. 
And, and that really gets into that break even cost or that payback period of someone has to pay those off if they haven't paid for themselves yet. And, and so once we get out to that four or five years of age, we see the, that line just stabilizing, that, that those heifers are, or those heifers that we developed at that time point, the ones that are left at that age, really fit that nutritional management, that environment fairly well at that point. Um, so that's very important to think about is how can I develop heifers and, and develop at a cost that I can get them through this phase right here and have a lower break even age and, and higher profitability. The other aspect to that is the financial requirements of any development system we have. And so we've got to think about the economics of it. Just like any other enterprise that we have in a cow-calf system, we've got to think about developing heifers from a financial side. If it was a yearling, right, uh, like a, a, a steer operation or a yearling operation, we wouldn't deem it the same way as we deem reproduction events. And, and, and so we, we kind of hold heifer development up on a pedestal, and that sometimes draw, takes away from the financial and really creates issues where, where we, we become non-profitable with that group of heifers because our cost in those heifers. So I like to think of heifer development or, or that replacement heifer in a debt present value is whether I'm purchasing that heifer or retaining that heifer, I want to consider the economic value of that heifer. So we do that. It's the net worth, uh, some revenue that's going to earn in its lifetime, which includes salvage value minus any expenses over that time. And so there, there's, there's many different scenarios in this or, or inputs in this of of my cow cost controls that, my replacement rate controls that. But a big one is just investment costs. That investment cost is a big factor in what the heifer is going to make you down the road. This is some data from a previous PhD student of mine that we, we looked at uh, with this study, it was a low fit heifer development study, but we looked at from a economics model of, of our low pit system versus putting those heifers in a dry lot to achieve 65 percent of the mature body weight by time of breeding. And so our investment cost in the low input was was about eleven $1 hundred dollars. Our investment cost of putting heifers in a dry lot to achieve 65 percent of their body weight was about six hundred dollars more than their counterparts. And, and so think about your cost of, and this scenario may not fit you because your dry lot could be much cheaper than the dry lot cost in the study, or your range situation may be more expensive than the low input in the in this study. But that investment is very important in controlling um, that net present value. And so when we looked at net present value at 11 years of age, those low input heifers had almost a $400 net present value. Put them in a dry lot for roughly 100 days, their net present value was about a negative $900. So at 11 years of age, they made you a negative $900 in this model. And so that $600 difference in investment cost of developing heifers for roughly 100 days it is driving this huge decrease in net present value. And so in this scenario, since we only had the heifer prey grades, we considered reproduction from then on the same across those. So the only thing changed in this model was my investment cost, my development cost in the study. And so that investment cost can really control your profitability of your ranch just by your inputs of your heifers themselves. So let's move to some, some nutritional aspects of, uh, of heifer development in, in ways that we possibly can decrease that cost uh, and still achieve acceptable or high reproductive uh, or performance. And, and so this is a really a cornerstone heifer development study that was done here in Nebraska by Don Platten 
in back in 1983. And what it was was a, a study from weaning to breeding on different rates of gain and, and when they occurred. And so they had uh, one treatment was a low rate of gain. So basically what we think about a restricted gain over winter and then a compensatory gain effect at some point uh, out to breeding. The second treatment was just a steady gain the whole time from weaning to breeding. And, and the third was, was a high rate of gain, then basically kind of a maintain or a slow gain after that. And, and so what the study found was it didn't matter. As long as they got to that target body weight to start breeding, that conception rate was the same, puberty was the same, and, and that calf performance the next year was the same. So it didn't matter how you got there as long as you got there. And so a lot of studies have been based off of this idea set, and I'll show you over the years of, uh, of different scenarios using this concept, just changing that date of when those rates of, uh, of gain change. A very, very similar study um, uh, done at K-State in the 90s looked at it very similar, but they changed when that rate of gain would change and the study was 30 days prior to breeding. And so uh, they had an even gain from November, basically weaning to April, and then they had the, what you call late, they go late gain, or that slow to, to high gain. And so that high gain, or compensatory gain effect, happened about 30 days prior to breeding. And, and similar last study, no difference in pregnancy rates, but they did decrease their feed cost by 10% with that low to high or that late gain. And at the end of the day, they had fairly similar pre-breeding weights, and, and more than likely they didn't show it. By the time they preg checked these heifers, they probably was very similar body weights by the time they preg checked later that fall. Um, and so very similar last study, they just changed that um, timing when that slow to, to high gain occurred. So this was uh, a, a study of mine or a PhD student of mine. This is where our economics data came from. And, and so in, in the study, we used three different forge types uh, that we had in when I was on faculty at Tennessee. Um, but what was interesting with this is that uh, we used a higher quality tall fast U from January, uh, breeding occurred in April, versus some native forages of uh, big blue stem and then switchgrass. Uh, and so in the study, with the tall fescue, it was similar to what those previous studies found was, was a, um, a, a steady gain or that constant gain effect. The, the other difference between the study is we basically flushed these heifers out or, or used our environment at the time of breeding to have a, a big flushing event. Uh, in our heifers that were grazing the native pastures. So that big blue stem or switchgrass pasture. And in the switchgrass pasture, for instance, they're actually losing body weight from January to April. And so they lost nearly 50, 60 pounds at that time frame. And when we put cedars in, we turned them out to a fresh fescue pasture that was really high quality and they took off. Uh, and so when we look at their pregnancy rates or AI rates, no difference in AI rates between the three treatments and no difference in overall pregnancy rates by how we develop those heifers. So even heifers losing body weight in this instance had a high reproductive performance. But, but the key to this is that you've got to watch these heifers and you've got to know your nutritional environment. Right, if, if we rely on compensatory gain effect, it has to be there. If you think about the last few years that we've had in Nebraska, green up has occurred a little slower for us in, in, in the sand hills. And if I needed that to occur earlier on, that could be influencing my preg rates where I don't have that compensatory gain when I need it. And so knowing your, your environment is very important when you go into these low input systems. Uh, and when you really need that comp compensatory gain effect. This was a study of mine for my PhD that looked at um, developing heifers out on the range versus in a dry lot. And so over winter from January, May, that feedlot group or that dry lot group 
were developed to gain a pound and a half per day. Uh, where that range group were somewhere around a half a pound per day gain. Um, and, and so by, by May started breeding, breeding there's about a hundred pound difference between the two groups. But in New Mexico, they get their monsoonal rain starting in May and June. They get their green ups. And we find the heifers in that system really compensate and they take off then. And so by the time we palpate or, or pregnancy check those um, that fall, very similar body weight. Um, but the big difference here is pregnancy rates. Um, and, and so pregnancy rates in the feedlot group was actually at 88%. Pregnancy rates in this range group was at 96%. And so this was a long-term several-year study. Uh, and so utilizing your environment can really decrease your cost, but you've got to really watch those environments. You've got to watch your forage quality uh, and, and let those cows tell you where they're at because it's easily can go backwards, right? You can have a train wreck by doing this low input system, and you're calling us, well, I've got problems. My preg rates are, are extremely low. Well, it's probably because your force quality is low and you didn't, those, those efforts didn't compensate early enough or didn't at all. And so, so you know, using these types of, of methods to develop efforts can be very good from an economic standpoint. It also can be a train wreck if you're not careful and you're really watching your environment. A side note to the study was we looked at the longevity of these heifers. And so one of the questions we always got was, was the following year, what's the rebreed percentages? Do we have dystocia issues? Are these heifers falling out of the herd faster due to the low input system? And what's interesting, when we look at out to five years of age, developing heifers on that native range versus feedlot, there was 68% of heifers left versus 42. And so the difference was 100, 100 days. We took the feedlot group or the dry lot group out of that environment for 100 days, put them in a dry lot where they saw a nutritional environment they'll never see again, brought them back, and they had fairly acceptable preg rates as a yearling, but after that, that decline was pretty quick. And so one, we could be selecting for infertile heifers within that group, but two, we totally changed our heifers when we take them out of our environment, especially limited uh, semi-arid environments, and put them in a dry lot and feed them at a higher rate of gain. So it totally changes that heifer by doing that. Um, so like I said, just 100 days really changed those heifers. And, and so there's a lot of studies on this, but we, we think that that really gives uh, by developing efforts within their environment, it just gives them ingrained adaptability to that environment. That they can withstand uh, and, and you really can select for heifers that have the capability of adapting to those nutritional stressors that they're gonna see within an environment later on in their life. So that's a very important concept from the longevity economics of it, is that am I developing heifers that can stay within the herd? If I, am I developing heifers that fit my management in my, my environment? Travis, I think Paul has a question. Paul? Yep. Yeah, Travis, uh, my name is Paul Hay. I'm a retired extension educator, Beatrice. My question is, when we're uh, uh, developing these heifers in a model where we're keeping those out on some rough range and doing this, there, there must be a kind of a minimum standard. I have to be able to do about so much in order to get them to uh, develop, uh, grow structurally, uh, grow some capacity, just that fundamental growth. Is, is that around, what, what do you think that is? Around a pound a day or what do I, what do I need to do? And I can compensate that later as you're pointing out, but what, what's the base that I really have to have there? So, you know, in, in these studies, and there's been several in Nebraska and other areas, that we're typically around a half to three quarters of a pound per day in that time frame. 
And, and so th that's, you know, and, and Jess, that's probably where we're at. Um, you know, during that, well, that green up when they compensate, you know, they're over two pounds per day gain then, and they generally catch up. And, and, you know, looking at this data here, by the time they're five years of age, they're the same body weight. And you couldn't tell the difference between either system outside of the, the preg rate difference out of developing in that, that dry lot scenario. And, and so, you know, I, I would say you're right, there is, there, is a, there is a minimum, right? And so we're not saying to starve heifers or, or, or uh, have this really low, low um, uh, gain over winter because you're right, they're not going to develop. And we, we can see that some, especially with, with cold stress events. Like a couple of years ago when how wet it was and how cold it was, um, we, we saw some, some uh, reproductive tract issues in a lot of heifers. And so, um, so, so th that it can be a problem. Um, but as long as you're somewhere, I would say between a half and three quarters of a pound per day, we don't generally see that issue. And would that, do you think that would hold too? We have uh, tend to have uh, 14, 1500 pound cows in southeast Nebraska here versus uh, 1200 pound cows out there, 1150s. What is, do you think that's the same kind of truth there or not? Yeah, so, so you've really got to know your environment, right? So the, a cow that will fit here may not fit there, or vice versa. And, and so, you know, a dry lot system may work great there. And so, um, due, due to your nutritional restrictions or, or, or how you manage your cows, is really going to dictate how what system works best for you. And, and so, in eastern Nebraska, you know, a dry lot system with, with a higher rate of gain um, may work a lot better than a dry lot system with a higher rate of gain here. And it's just really do back to how you're managing down the road and how they're fitting down the road. So Travis, we got another question here and, and the question was, can you develop heifer, heifers in Western Nebraska on dormant range uh, like Tennessee? Uh, and, and the follow up to that was a K-State study compared heifer development on wheat pasture and dry lot and the conception on wheat pasture was lower with heifers. Yeah, you, you can, and, and there's been plenty of studies from um, uh, Gene Deicher on, have done plenty of studies of developing heifers uh, at that lower rate of gain in Western Nebraska. Uh, and so, um, you know, that, that Tennessee study was, really fits a Western model. The only difference was the type of cows in Tennessee that really makes it interesting is those are big cows. You know, that's a, well, we were probably about 45% of body weight, mature body weight with those cows in Tennessee during that study. And so we're talking about 15, 1600 mature body weight cows that, that we're applying this to and, and still had high reproductive performance. And, and so, you know, if you compare dry lot versus wheat pasture or annual rye or anything else, there's been a lot of studies, you know, coming from Oklahoma, there's a lot of heifers on wheat pasture that have high pregnancy rates. Uh, and so it's really, and I'll show you some data next, but it's really how you manage during that breeding season that's controlling that. It's not that they're in a dry lot or they're on wheat pasture or annual rye that's causing any increase or decrease in pregnancy rate at that point. It's how, how I'm managing heifers after that point. And I'll show you some of the issues that you may occur uh, that can cause some of that decrease in, in pregnancy rates uh, in those different models. And so this was some data out of South Dakota that, that looked at uh, developing heifers in, in range versus a dry lot going to range. So think about this, and we a lot of guys do this to dry lot to range would be like an annual forage to some grass would be a similar model to, to that uh, outside of their grazing versus being in a pen fed. 
but we see a, can see a similar effect in those systems sometimes. Uh, but in the study where they AI'd roughly May 18th, turn them out to, uh, well, they had the, past, the, the range group, turn the dry lot out to range with them. And we see they saw average daily gains just drop for about a week during that time frame. And so taking them out or putting them in that dry lot really changes one behavior. And, and so they have some behavior data. It's pretty interesting to look at uh, gra grazing times and grazing amounts. But if you, you, you change the requirements of the heifer when you put them in a dry lot and, and, you, and you change how they graze and how often they graze once they go out to pasture for a period of time. So if I AI'd those cows during that time frame, they're in a negative energy power or they're losing body weight, then you're gonna have some negative effects on reproduction during that time frame. And so you can expect for that first cycle or that during that AI time frame that she's not gonna get pregnant. And so overall pregnancy rates may increase or, or may be the same. Timing when she got pregnant may be different between those because of basically what they're showing here is is you have this uh, loss in body weight going from a dry lot to a pasture. And, and so that's maybe why, you know, in that last study I showed you from New Mexico that we had 84% preg rates in that dry lot group at that pound and a half per day gain. And we don't have the body weight data as closely as this, but they could have been losing body weight during that breeding season earlier on, causing some of that decline in pregnancy rates. Uh, overall, they found no difference in conception rate or, or uh, from AI conception rate, there was a difference, but there wasn't a difference in pregnancy rates overall. Like I said, you probably missed that first cycle and you're catching them on that second and third or depending on the length of, of that breeding season. Very similar study. So they looked at this a little differently. And, and this is why I tell producers that put heifers in a dry lot is. If you put heifers in dry lot, I'd like them out grazing about 30 days before breeding season. So I want to get through that phase. If they're losing body weight, I want to get to that earlier before breeding. And so in the study, uh, roughly about 45 days before breeding, um, they have their dry lot group versus their pasture group. Um, where that dry lot group is gaining more than their pasture group. Uh, from 35 to, to 24 days before breeding, they're the same. 24 to about three days before breeding, uh, they're the same. And then when they take that dry lot group and put them out on, um, on that pasture at that point, similar to last study is they start losing body weight, that average daily gain goes down. Back here, 45 days when they did it with this group, you got through that negative time frame. You got through where that had a decline in average daily gain. And, and, and you saw where my average daily gains are after that. So timing of when that occurs is very important. I don't want heifers to lose body weight or a negative energy balance or, or, or have a decline in average daily gain through that breeding season. And we see this happen quite a bit, in, especially in some of the sum, summer calving herds, is that you know, they come in a really good body condition score. We go into breeding and they start slipping. And so we see heifers get bred early or don't get bred at all. And it's because of that timing of that average daily gain and where, where they're at. Uh, and we probably see a little bit more embryonic loss due to that than um, uh, that's causing some of that reproductive issues. So nutrition and timing of breeding and through that breeding is probably the most critical part of, of heifer development. You know, in, in the 19, early 1980s, early 1990s, it was always pre-weaning gain really is controlling because of puberty. We selected for puberty traits, whether or not it's through wool selection, for so long, puberty is not an issue with, with cattle in the United States like it is in other countries. So nutrition and timing of breeding is probably the most important time frame of heifer development. Because they can be in really good condition, but losing body weight for a week can cause a decline in reproductive performance. Uh, and so 
that gain or that timing gain is probably a lot more more important than percent of mature body weight. And so if I can get heifers gaining body weight in a, in a, in a steady rate of gain, it doesn't matter what her mature body weight was prior, previously, as long as I can get her gaining body weight. In those low input systems, we got to rely on compensatory gain. If it's not there, you're going to have train wrecks. The other component we didn't talk about is using uh, of, uh, progesterone uh, compounds. Well, uh, it's cedars, it's prostaglandin, something in, in those systems really helps in, in low input systems. And so we can have some negative impacts of low input if we're not using some kind of synchronization. So that really helps, uh, especially if they're under development of, of jump starting heifers. And so from a dry lot to pasture scenario, we've really got to adapt them to grazing again prior to AI or prior to that start of breeding. So if I go from dry lot and turn them into that pasture, I can have some issues. And so I warn producers of how they develop heifers of getting out of the dry lot and that timing of that dry lot. Either move them out of there about 30 days before, or we're going to like to hold them in that dry lot through that breeding season before turning them back out. If you turn them out, um, one, we may have to look at supplementation, even if quality of forage is there. There's some research from South Dakota that shown that just a little bit of supplementation really helps with those bread rates uh, of heifers that's been in the dry lot turned back out to pasture. And so one thing I stress is I really want similar average daily gains if I move from dry lot to pasture. And a lot of times we turn out from a high quality to a, a lower quality pasture that, that causes some of that decline in average daily gain. So with that, I'd gladly take any questions or? All right, so do we have questions for Travis? Uh, we had a couple come in on the chat, so I'll start with one just to get things going. Uh, one of the questions was uh, based on the on the data you were showing, if you fed in the dry lot for ro low rates of gain, would you still get the compensatory gain during the period out on range? And then would that yeah. actually uh, lower your costs overall by going with that type of a model? Yeah, there, there's been a few studies that looked at lower dry lot average daily gains. And, and really had similar effects once they turned out to pasture. You, they didn't get the compensatory gain like you would have planned or expected. It, it, and so, you know, taking them out of, of a pasture setting, grazing setting, and put them in a dry lot really changes behavior. And so even if nutrient quality was similar across those, or, or that you restricted in the dry lot and put them out of pasture, you, know, you still, don't capture that compensatory gain like we see going from a low quality range into a, a grain up higher quality pasture situation. So, so what you're saying is that period of adjustment that takes a, a week or two, um, I mean, it doesn't take a week or two, it lasts longer than that? It, it can, yeah, it, it can last uh, at least two weeks in some instances. And so, and it can last longer than that. I've seen data where heifers have developed in a dry lot situation, it takes a year to graze like their counterparts um, that were developed out on range. And, and that, that is, is bigger environments and more extensive environments that you see that in. But yeah, it can be longer term than just a week or two. Travis, I've got a question if you've got time. Yep, go ahead, Brent. So those low input um, systems, what does that do to, to mature cow weight? You know, they, they catch up. And so they may not hit mature body weight until six years of age versus five years of age. Okay. But they catch up. Uh, and so I can show you data on that. But, but they have similar body weight at the end of the day. It's just that they may have a, 
it may take them like another year before they actually stabilize to their, their mature body weight. Um, our data actually shows, I saw Rob's on here, but, and he could talk about this. Our, our data actually shows that our seven, eight year old cows are continued growing. And, and so uh, we never really truly stabilize in, 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 our, in our cow herd here at Goodmanson. Um, but they're not stunted, I, I guess I'd say, Brent. You don't, you don't really stunt them. Yep, I, I, and I would agree. It just seemed like the, the work that Deitcher and Funston did at 53% versus 65. Yeah. As a mature cow, three, four, five years down the road, they were maintained a, a lighter weight. R right, yep. And I think they were pretty close at the end of, of that study. Uh, they wasn't that far off, but they were still a little bit lighter.